religion, or at least public religious life, had been beaten down. There wasn't very much religious life um, or activity going on in China. And in fact, China was at at that point was at the end of almost a hundred year period of a sustained attack on religion that had been primarily led by China's elites as a response to this crisis of confidence that people had in China about their own civilization, the value of their own uh, faiths and beliefs. Um, you know, at the end of the, and people think it only has to do with the communists, that it was all the Cultural Revolution, and people always say, oh, the religious life was destroyed in the Cultural Revolution, which it was, but it started a lot earlier. It started in the 19th century, um, in the 100 Days of Reform from in 1898, Kanye Wei, the famous reformer, uh, advocated converting temples into schools. So, Miao uh, Gai Xiao was sort of the, the slogan. Um, in, in one of these apocryphal uh, moments of history, Sun Yat Sen, of course, the famous revolutionary, <coughs> one of young men in Guangdong setting off on his uh, journey of rebellion. He went to the local temple uh, in Guangdong and smashed the statues of the gods. The idea that you know religion was this backward thing that was holding China back from progress, from modernity. Um, and of course, this came to a head with the May 4th movement. China needed science, it needed democracy. All of this other stuff was sort of mumbo jumbo from the past. Uh, China imported a vocabulary uh, from the West via Japan of religion, zongjiao, and superstition, nishin, uh, which uh, terms that were not really used in China in that this way to describe things. Just, of course, reformers realized that there was religion in advanced countries like in the West, so some religion must be kind of okay. Christianity was taken as the norm, especially Protestant Christianity, um, and everything else was then defined as superstition. And this affected most Chinese religious life because it's a mistake to think that what we now call there's Buddhism, there's Taoism, and there's this other thing that the government now is supporting, folk religion. Um, these were separate religions with their own hierarchy and clergy across the country in the way that, say, Protestantism or Catholicism existed in Europe in, historically. 95% um, of temples in traditional China, however you want to define that, um, were locally run, uh, they were not part of some national network. Um, some would have definitely been Buddhist or Taoist if you went to Udang Shan uh, 200 years ago, it would have been full of Taoists. If you went to Wu Tai Shan, it would have been full of Buddhists. Um, but it's not um, really accurate to think most religious life in China, most of it was communal, it was local, a lot of it um, were to local gods uh, or even geographic features, holy mountains, etc. Um, all of these things were defined as superstition. Um, and so this started, again, we're talking still before the communists uh, got their hands on things. So under Chiang Kai-shek, the, the nationalists had the New Life movement, uh, the nationalists had a uh, pass a law about which temples should be saved and which temples should be destroyed. And this is all wonderfully detailed in Rebecca Nadestump's book, Superstitious Regimes. Um, now, when the communists, so when the, this, and these are sort of total ballpark figures, this is from Vincent Gossar and David Palmer in their book, The Religious Life, The Religious Question of China, they think that at the end of the 19th century, there were roughly one million temples in China, which I think is, even for a ballpark figure, is far too low. But they think that half of them were destroyed or repurposed by the mid middle of the 20th century. And I think this may be a, a useful way of thinking it, that a lot had already happened, in any case, before the communists took over. When the communists take over, of course, they're the most radical group that will <coughs> change China, and they carry this through. Um, with um, sort of a vengeance, right? Uh, they set up five committees to run religious, the five 
religions or the five religious groups that have coalesced out of the wreckage of the old system. So that would be Buddhism, Taoism, Islam, and then for administrative purposes, Christianity is split in two, Protestantism and Catholicism. So you get these five groups that are set up in China. Um, but that only lasts for a few years or even less, because by the end of the 1950s, uh, these radical, increasingly radical leftist experiments are uh, being carried out, cu culminating with the Cultural Revolution, but not really just starting with it. So um, by the end of the Cultural Revolution, almost every place of worship has been uh, destroyed or closed or shuttered um, across the country. Hence, you can kind of understand when you when somebody went to China in the 70s or 80s, there wasn't a whole lot going on. Um, but I began to realize that I was wrong in thinking that religious life was uh, insignificant or dying. When I came back in the 1990s, I was in China then from 94 to 2001, and this was at the uh, high point uh, of the Qigong movement. And Qigong, if you're familiar or not, it's a form of physical cultivation, bodily cultivation. You can think of it sort of analogous to yoga in the Indian tradition. It's a way of uh, using your body to achieve another spiritual level or dimension, if you will. Um, Qigong groups were, Qigong was, is a neologism formed in the 1950s by the communists to describe sort of healing techniques, and it was used alongside acupuncture and herbal medicine. And then in the 1980s, it jumped to the public sphere, and you had these Qigong masters in parks across China who were teaching Qigong. And Qigong was not um, registered as a religion. It was registered as a kind of martial arts, so it was not one of the five groups, Buddhism, Taoism, Islam, Protestantism, and Catholicism. It was free from the limitations of the state administration of religious affairs, um, or the Religious Affairs Bureau, as it was called then. It could, they, so these Qigong masters went to parks around China, taught Qigong, handed out tracts, booklets with their teachings, their ideas, and as the 90s progressed, these became increasingly sophisticated, and they had ideas about morality and what was uh, wrong with society. And of course, this culminated with the Falun Gong movement, um, which then challenged the government in one of the most colossal miscalculations, probably, uh, by having a sit-down strike in front of Zhou Nanhai in 1999. And the government um, was uh, reacted predictably with a massive crackdown. Um, scores of people were beaten to death in police custody, and thousands were sent to labor camps. And um, Falun Gong kind of, um, at least in mainland China, at least openly, um, ceased to exist as a, as a, as a group, at least. Um, and I think that, well, this is pure speculation on my part, and I have no way of proving this, but at least sequentially, into the new millennium, you had a growth of the five established religions. And I think many of them had fewer controls, especially Buddhism and Taoism. Uh, and I think the government's idea, and I've heard this from many people, but there's no document showing it, I doubt the document exists, but probably the idea was, if there is this spiritual yearning, it's better that it comes out through one of these groups that we feel we can control in some way, even if we can't necessarily, uh, rather than coming out some other way through a group like Falun Gong or some Qigong group that we have no idea about and that practices in parks and so on and so forth. So better that it be in one of these groups that are not under our control. Now that sort of raises the question, why was religion growing? Um, partly I think it was a restoration of what you could consider to be normal religious life, um, but partly um, it was a feeling in Chinese society that there were no shared values, um, there were no minimum moral standards. Uh, I remember talking to Falun Gong people in the 1990s who constantly talked about this, the idea that all that matters in society is money, and there's got to be more to life than making money. Um, 
and that society was immoral, there was mass corruption, and we have to have something to believe in uh, that is that, that, that provides us with some kind of structure in our life, some kind of moral structure. Because clearly, after the Cultural Revolution, no one could seriously believe in communism anymore, and the government wasn't or the, wasn't able to or didn't allow people to develop on their own some kind of alternative morality. So it sort of came up through religion. Um, I think a lot of this wasn't really captured. I think in the West we tended to, up until recently, focus mainly on China as an economic story and the rising superpower, um, especially culminating in the 2008 Olympics, the sort of self-congratulatory extravagant show that China put on, and then that coincided also with the, uh, the financial crisis here and the Great Recession, or whatever they, the, the word they used to avoid the word depression. Um, uh, and, and I think there was this uh, focus on that. But I think, I think many people in China had already moved beyond the prosperity uh, or being satisfied with prosperity. Many people, by the 21st century, well, by the first decade, were beginning to really feel this spiritual void. Um, many people already were prosperous, had a roof over their head, and enough to close to wear, and so on and so forth, and were looking for answers. And I think that to, to the you know eternal questions in life, why are we here, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think this is something the government couldn't really answer. I think, um, I think, yeah. Let's get on to the contemporary sort of situation. I think Xi Jinping realized this um, when he took power, or the, yeah, it didn't just start with Xi Jinping, but certainly he latched onto this dissatisfaction with society that had been rumbling along in the Jiang and Hu Jintao era. And part of his idea of rejuvenation is a moral rejuvenation. So we know, of course, we read a lot about the anti-corruption crackdown. Um, this is part of it, but it's also part of, in a more positive, mystic way, trying to create values to use some of the old traditions um, to buttress the government's claim to uh, legitimacy. Uh, and, and this is not unfamiliar. We see this in. Russia, for example, Putin um, all of a sudden turning into a, a supporter of the Orthodox Church and, and Russian values and traditions. Uh, and, and I think the, the Communist Party has done something similar as well. It didn't, again, it didn't sort of happen overnight in 2012 when Xi Jinping took power at the 18th Party Congress, and of course yesterday we started the 19th Party Congress. but. Um, but it, it really, I think, like a lot of things under Xi Jinping, got a firm jolt. Um, one of the things I highlight in my book is um, intangible cultural heritage, which is a very funny sounding term. It's a term from UNESCO, from the UN Education, Science, and Cultural Organization. It's meant to be things that are not the Great Wall, not the Forbidden City, but practices, rituals, music, even cuisine, drama um, that need protecting. Uh, China is, of course, obsessed with all these lists and having the most uh, UNESCO uh, registered cultural sites and, and intangible cultural practices. But the interesting thing is that inside China, they have created these lists. And so they have national level intangible cultural heritage, it's called FEI in Chinese, in the abbreviation FEI. National level, provincial level, city level, district level, you have over 10,000 kind of practices that, are, that get government support in one way or another. Um, <coughs> and not all of them have a religious component. It could be that you're the um, most famous kind of Sichuanese cook, uh, and you are the successor of a long line of famous cooks from in Chengdu, and you may get some sort of support from the government to train people in, in traditional Sichuanese cuisine. 
But many of these do have a spiritual component, including music, um, drama, and rituals, and even pilgrimages themselves. And I describe uh, this pilgrimage outside of Beijing to Miaofengshan, uh, which has been the subject of study for many, many, many years. Uh, when Sidney Gamble went there uh, in the 19, to China in the 1920s and 30s, he made films, which you can see on YouTube, of the Miaofengshan pilgrimage. Uh, and now this actually gets government support, the whole pilgrimage itself, they get subsidies to put this on, the groups that go and perform there, um, they get money, a little bit of money, it's not enough to make it really a commercial venture, but it's often enough to buy costumes or to rent a bus to go there. So this is something the government wants to um, see happen. Um, so when I went to uh, research this book, um, I tried to keep, uh, it's made up of five storylines, or five case studies, if you want to think of it like that. Um, I tried to go for geographic diversity, I didn't want it all to be set in Beijing and Shanghai or the East Coast or something like that. There is one story in Beijing, I didn't all, I wanted a country, some rural, uh, rural component as well, so I have rural Taoists and Shanxi. I wanted Christianity, but I didn't want the book to be only about Christianity. I think a lot of people, instead of it, because I'm a natural contrarian and, uh, and, and not very good at marketing, I, could have pro I probably should have written a book only about Christianity in China. Um, and that's certainly a great story, uh, and, and Christianity is growing very quickly in China, and it's very interesting. But it's not the biggest religion, and in some ways, especially I think it's in recent years, it's probably not even the most important religion. So I, I have one of the five stories is about a Protestant congregation in Chengdu. Um, I also wanted some non organized religious activity, because I think that's how a lot of people in China, and indeed in our own societies, experience religion. So these are people who practice a kind of internal uh, kind of meditation, a Taoist meditation called internal alchemy, Nei Dan, and so we go with them on these retreats to the caves in Zhejiang province. And then there's the government itself, which I think is a major player its own quasi-religious rituals, like the 19th Party Congress. Um, I, I have a section on the 18th Party Congress, and it really is exa you know, it's exactly the same. Congress after Congress, you have these really bizarre scenes of these people, the elders behind them, like some kind of Greek uh, choir, and this very formulaic thing, and you try to make yourself immortal as a leader, you know, by having your theory enshrined in the Constitution. Uh, so this whole idea of will there be Xi Jinping thought or just the thought of Xi Jinping, this whole thing, it's a kind of way to become a Xianren, almost like you know, a communist immortal, uh, by, by getting up there with the, with the big boys like Deng and, you know, and all this sort of stuff. So I described that. Uh, but the government's own embrace of this. Uh, so I also talked to a propagandist who helped put together the China Dream campaign um, and come up with the idea of using these traditional images um, and, 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 and describe how he and these other people in this kind of brainstorming session came up with these ideas. So that was the uh, overall structure of the book and I structured it through one calendar year so we can go through different uh, holidays and rituals and so on and so forth. Uh, not to imply that everything is the same year after year in China, just like the dynastic cycles or something, but um, rather because it, things do repeat themselves. And I think that the change, often we get caught up, too caught up in the immediate news and this idea that everything in China is changing and it, nothing is the same as it, was, as it was last year. And you know, often people will say, oh, if he's tell a cabbie, oh, I'm going back to China, I haven't been there in a month, the, the cabbie in, in the United States was, oh, everything's changed since then, you know, and uh, I think we've almost got caught up in this idea that China is changing so rapidly we can't recognize it from, from month to month or year to year. I think there is, there is a lot of change in China, but it is actually much more gradual than we think. Um, and so having a cyclical thing like that, you see change happening, but it's not sort of these big events that are happening one after the other. 
Um, so that that's the overall overall premise of the book, why I got interested in it. Um, I think we could also talk about uh, many of the tensions that exist, the government's efforts to instrumentalize religion, to use religion, um, and these new religious regulations that are meant to kind of put a damper on this. But maybe that's best left to the question and answer session. We've gone on for half an hour. And um, so maybe I'll stop now and, or leave it to you. Can I ask yeah. you to elaborate a little yeah. bit on the uh, religious symbology in the China dream, and, uh, the kind of, which you alluded to at the end, and the, the guy in the propaganda department who said he consciously yeah. drew on these things. That sounds interesting. Yeah, so I, um, I got to know this fellow who, uh, who uh, has been working. He's, a, he's from Hunan, which is Mao's home province, and he's written um, ballet and, and, and opera about Mao, and he's edited books on Mao, and he's, uh, he used to work for the Hunan the propaganda ministry, and now he's a freelance propagandist, and he seems to spend his time going around China advising local governments on how to effectively carry out their propaganda, and some of this is on... Um, some of his lectures are on Yoku, so you can even find it uh, on the show. This is like a Chinese version of YouTube. Um, and I, he, so he told me that starting just before, roughly in 2011, the, so you know the way they have these party congresses every five years, and then in between every autumn they have these plenums. And the plenum the year before 2012, 2011, um, what push culture, but they were not talking about subsidizing a symphony orchestra. They were talking about culture in the sense of a business, how a business thinks of corporate culture. Like, what is the what is what are the ideas that are going to keep this place running? And they began to push the idea of traditions. And so he began to lecture. He went down to Guizhou, and they found people who were uh, and Guizhou. It's not. Coincidental, because Guizhou is, for various reasons, has pushed Confucian culture quite a lot, quite aggressively over the past decade. I have an article in today's, I think it's today's, it was online now, I just went online, on Wang Yangming, this Confucian in scholar. The Times, so, or today's in, the, in today's New York Times, yeah, um, or it's in tomorrow's New York Times. Yeah. Anyway, it's on, just went online. Uh, and it says on Wang Yangming, and he is this Confucian scholar who sort of achieved this enlightenment and 1509 um, in Guiyang. And so Guizhou has been pushing Confucianism. And so this guy, um, Xie, he went down there and was lecturing. And they said, what you really need to do is we want to have these model heroes and model things. You can't have Lei Feng and these model Confucian heroes of the past. Nobody believes in them anymore. You need to have people who are inspired by traditional values, like Confucianism. And so they had some guy who looked after his, his old parents and did all these sort of, you know, crazy feats, uh, like, you know, to, to look after his parents to show how, how pious, how filial pious he was. And um, so when they were coming up with the China Dream, they were looking for images. And um, I mean, I could, well, I could show you the picture if you want. I don't know. Sure. sure, I mean, I can. Uh, you, you have to go online? Yeah, but it's right. So. How do I go to the other slideshow? Okay. I have another slideshow on this. Uh, you just go tab. That's it, yeah. Uh, and you, we can go to that five together. Okay. Here. Oh, that's, that's the guy, that's the propagandist. And this is, these are, it's funny the stuff you find on WeChat that you do. Uh, so he went to, to Tianjin, uh, to this place called uh, Ni, uh, Niranjiang. Uh, it's this traditional sort of, uh, I think he's, he's sort of like Norman Rockwell cliche, kind of like jolly uh, people. And, and, and you can find these clay things or at every sort of gift shop, shop in China. Um, and center, he saw this in somebody's workshop and he said, oh, what is this? And the, the craftsman said, oh, it's, uh, it's longing. It's about a kid thinking, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he said, no. He said, 
we will call it uh, my dream, the China dream. No, China dream, my dream. Or the other way around. Anyways, it's implying my dream and the China dream are the same thing. So he got this statue uh, out of the guy's shelf and immediately said, this is going to be the symbol of the China dream campaign. And uh, so they got together and they had these madmen sort of brainstorming <laughs> sessions. This is actually not the same thing, but this is, he put, puts all this stuff on WeChat. And uh, they have these, uh, and so here you have it. Uh, and if you've been to China in the past five years, you probably have not been able to avoid these propaganda posters, which are all over the place. And he told me, we're going to have a 60,000 kilometer campaign. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, there are 60,000, I don't know, public roads or, or highways or, uh, you know, including maybe state roads around China, they're all going to be wallpapered with these posters. And for a while, it really seemed like it was. I mean, it was um, all around town. He took other statues as well and turned these into the posters. And some of them are communist ideals, and some of them express more traditional Chinese ideals. But the, and the key also is that he was taking traditional um, traditional images, here it is at the, outside the workers' gymnasium in Beijing. I'm so lazy, I just take a picture outside my part. But you can really find this all over <laughs> Beijing. And okay, this is like a total aside, it is sort of irrelevant, but it's so funny. Uh, this campaign, he won some like public service award, which is you know sort of weird. You think a public service award is something for cancer, you know, like some Ogilvy and Mather put together pro bono uh, to help cancer awareness, but they won a public service award because they helped the Communist Party make their own propaganda campaign. Which, anyway, so he won this big thing, and then it was like such a big hit, they said, let's find somebody who looks like the kid. Uh, so they had them like contest, and they found actually a 30-year-old woman on the far left who like made herself up to look like she's a four-year-old. And then they had an artist who then made a picture of the woman and so they had this like big ceremony where they put this all together and then they put it on a Campbell soup camp I mean, not Campbell, it was kind of a mushroom sauce brand and made it into there so I didn't you know I don't know where I'm going with the story <laughs> uh, religion yeah but you know some of the terms you see like at home like on that thing over Beijing uh, you know, Beijing overpass uh, this kind of imagery using traditional ideas, traditional pictures, it's a lot more effective. I mean, propaganda campaigns used to always look like this, this red banner with the yellow characters, right? That's what ever, it used to always kind of look like that. And now they've gotten a lot more savvy, and I think this is uh, by taking this stuff from traditional culture and religious ideas and pushing it. Um, and... Um, yeah, this is pushing tr traditional ideas. This is in Rutan Park, also the lazy man photo here. This is near where I live. But this is uh, just some traditional ideas on rearing families, and they have um, a whole series. This has been up for several months now. Sorry, this is sideways. Um, these are some, some ditty that's ascribed to Xi Jinping, and I've seen this in several temples around China. If you talk to Buddhists and Taoists, they really, really like Xi Jinping because they think he's in our corner. Uh, not so much, uh, and these are the kind of groups that get the intangible cultural heritage money to perform at the, um, I just scrolled up earlier, I think, also. This is outside Miao Feng Shan. And these are, the whole pilgrimage gets money uh, to, to put it on, and it's, you know, these are really, really popular. This is from the, it's the first to the 15th day of the fourth lunar month. Uh, so it's, you know, it's in the spring. So, uh, should I switch back? So, um, I can see that probably. But I think less happy with all of this have been any kind of religion with foreign ties. And when I said Buddhism, I was talking about <coughs> Han Buddhism, not Tibetan Buddhism. Mm -hmm. uh, I think any religion with foreign ties uh, has problems, and I mean, you know, most religions have some kind of foreign component to them. But especially hit hard are, I think, Catholics, Protestants, Muslims, um, and yeah, some Buddhists, because the government has made explicitly clear 
especially after the new religious uh, regulations were issued last year, that foreign ties were a no-no. And this is, this is not a surprise, because NGOs faced the same thing a year or so earlier with the new NGO regulations. So you basically can't get foreign money if it's really, really hard to get foreign money. So I think this is part of the government's effort to allow it to some degree, but to try to keep a lid on it and try not to allow it you know, they're very aware of these other religious movements that have undermined authoritarian regimes like in Eastern Europe, and they don't want a repeat of the Catholic Church in Poland. The, the, the concept, let me just ask one more. The concept of religion is kind of a modern Western religion as a separate sphere of, of life. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, a difficult, it's, a, it's not an easy concept. And as you say, when it was imported into China from Japan, and it's, so that's all a kind of caveat for me to be allowed to ask my question anyway, which is that if, if religion is something, as you said at the beginning of your talk about the great questions like, why are we here? When it becomes something like this cultural heritage or the, the, the posters in the street about the China dream is my dream. See, you know, so on the one hand is the sort of tortured philosophical religionist who has theological interests and wonders about good and evil in the world and the afterlife and guilt and sin. And then on the other side is people sort of dancing and doing propaganda. There's quite a gap. So my question is to what extent does, does the state's uh, appropriation of religious symbols do anything to actually address the spiritual hunger that motivated the Falun Gong and motivates some of the Christian congregations and some of the more, shall we say, serious, if I can say, kind of really, you know, truly religious um, experience. It's so modern of you to say. I know, oh, I, said, I said that at the beginning. <laughs> I thought I could get you to answer my question without any academic cavalling, but okay, all right. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I think all religions have a huge spectrum of yeah. belief. It's the same in the of Catholicism. I mean, you have uh, philosophical works and you have uh, rosary beads. Yeah. And it's the same in Buddhism. You can have very profound ideas and so on, and you can have people with almost the same thing, these beads that you have, 108 beads that you can uh, hold in your hands. Uh, so, I think, but, you know, I think the state, of course, it does risk wrecking some of this. Um, this, this pilgrimage, in fact, one of the groups that I've been following, and I started to really get involved with them after I finished writing the book, and I don't have this in the book, but it's an interesting story, um, it, it was a martial arts group very much like this. I joined the martial arts group and I learned all this stuff and so on and so forth. It was run by this uh, curmudgeonly old guy and his uh, nephew. And his nephew was in charge of the actual martial arts and the curmudgeonly old guy was in charge of the, of the musical side of it and he was also a very profoundly spiritual person who really, really believed, very devout. And his nephew, who was about 35, um, really wanted intangible cultural heritage designation. Because he was like, you know, there just aren't that many temples where we can perform. But if we have a Fei designation, we can go to all kinds of other things, and we can be much more active, and we can even go into the schools and teach kids this in the school, because it's so hard if we're just, he was out there for years in a park teaching people martial arts, and people would come and go, but they wouldn't really, you know, stay. Um, and he wanted to get into school. He wanted to, he said, you know, I wanted to walk the Communist Party's road. He was, <laughs> he was joking. But this caused a rift. And the, the uncle said, you can't do that if you're going to stay in, in my group. And so they split. And uh, they are bitter enemies now. And it's, it's really a sad story. And I think, uh, but I think these kind of groups, though, still satisfy a need for community. And I think that people, we all know how big Beijing is, it's enormous. In the past, there were these Danwei, the work unit that was set up by the communist, around a factory or by some kind of a, uh, a 
you know, where you work, your place of work, you, you lived in this area, and maybe you uh, had medical care provided for them. That was almost like an ersatz village. Um, that's been destroyed by economic reforms. And people don't have a great sense of community, and these groups do provide that. Um, you feel you can trust the people in there, and the 30 or 50 members of these pilgrimage associations. If you need something, you know, they're there for you. So it helps in some ways. Uh, I think, though, a lot of people won't be satisfied, and they're not satisfied. And that's why you also have a lot of underground religious activities. Uh, the church that I write about is an uh, unregistered church, so an underground church. Um, because people are not, a lot of people aren't satisfied with the government run organization. Thanks. Myra? Yeah, uh, well, thank you very much. Um, I, I, I agree with you when you say that uh, one, one, one aspect of the religious revival, of course, is, is the longing <laughs> for meaning. Uh, but what I find uh, interesting is, I think it's from another side as well, is that in, in part it was not so much revival as always being there. It was there even during the Cultural Revolution, but it was, as you say, it was not public. Uh, and uh, I did field work in Chabe in, in, in 1985 when things were just sort of uh, loosening up. But the, the village was filled with stories of ghosts and haunted houses that were known as to be haunted during the Cultural Revolution itself. And there were several uh, uh, homes which were dilapidated because they were, they were thought to be inhabited by ghosts. But I think, uh, the, uh, and, and later in, near Shanghai, in another uh, research in 1990, I was astonished to find them worshiping their ancestors on the Lunar New Year. No tablets, nothing, except bowls of, of uh, uh, bowls of, uh, of offerings, which of course were removed uh, uh, immediately, and I was told that we were doing it throughout the Cultural Revolution, but it leaves no evidence once the, once the worship is finished. But I, uh, so, I, so, I'm, so I'm wondering about these little manifestations, and I think that one thing that, that uh, I believe is, is going on is that the, the, the many of the traditional beliefs take the cosmos itself as being the religious object. You know, that, that you're basically walking on sacred terrain by being a human being on the planet, and that that survived to, uh, uh, to a large extent, so that uh, it wasn't so much that, re that religion in terms of, um, of what people feel or uh, how even people act in certain circumstances was totally wiped out during the Cultural Revolution, which of course you're not suggesting that at all. But, uh, but I think that in fact there was a very strong uh, uh, surviving uh, underground, if you will, uh, to religious belief, which makes the whole revival really make sense. Otherwise. It's, sort of comes out of nothing, and it did not come out of nothing, as you suggest, yeah. Yeah, no, I think there is, um, there is still a lot of belief in these ideas. One of the interesting things that I noticed coming back were the mini-seasons, the jie mm -hmm. uh, I mean, they, 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 they wouldn't just come back in the past five years, but they began to really come back, magazines devoted to their <coughs> mini-seasons of roughly two weeks, and there's 26 of them. Yeah. 24, 24 of them in a year. And um, so th these are now very, very popular. And you can, uh, even there's a grocery store chain in, in, in Beijing that sells Sorry. food. Uh, you know, it's, this, it's the whatever uh, beginning of autumn, you should be eating this or that. Uh, and people will sign off, you know, happy Dongzhir or happy you know, winter solstice to you and stuff like that, uh, magazines devoting issues to them, what kind of uh, stuff to drink and eat. Uh, that really also came, and it came back because people had this over, this underlying, right. these underlying ideas that were there. Uh, but I think what really changed, when I mean, you're talking about the village, one of the stories is in Shanxi province, and I think there, there was this high point of revival um, in the 90s when there was this need uh, for s traditional, say, funerals. And there were then people who were allowed to provide it, and people began to have a bit of money so they could put it on, and they had big, big funerals and big, big temple fairs. But now, um, you know, the, those people who really want the big funerals are dying out, and their kids have gone off to work in the factories on the coast. And they come back and they'll put on the funeral that dad wanted. But are they going to want a big three-day funeral? I kind of doubt it. And I think that that's where things are really changing. And so the guy, the family I write about, 
the father insists on staying in the village because he wants he wants to yeah stay in the ancestral village. The son is moved to the county seat, and he's sort of set up a, a shop there and provides a kind of more streamlined service for city people who just want one day funerals. And he has to explain a lot of stuff to people because even I say city people, this is just a county seat. It's not a, a big city by any means. But even there, people like uh, teachers and bureaucrats, they don't really know all the traditions. And so it's, it's, it is changing. And I wonder, you know, what, what will, if his son does this, because he's the ninth generation in his family, what will he be doing? He'll be like a, a funeral parlor director or something like that, or I don't know. But it'll, it's changing a lot. So this, it isn't really true that it's just a revival and all these old things are coming back. People want to believe that because it makes them feel more comfortable. Like, I'm just reviving these ancient traditions, you know, but in fact, it's completely different. Isn't there quite an urban rural and also a young old division with respect to this business of religion coming back? The yeah. old want it and the young don't. Don't need it. They're more atheistic. The I rural people secular. want it. I don't know about that. Um, because what I found in many of these groups um, is that you have a very a much younger profile, <clears throat> demographic profile, than you do in the West, let's say, if you go into a church. Um, now, this is not some statistically backed survey or it's anecdotal, but I think there are a lot of young people who are interested, but maybe the difference also is that younger people, just like people in the West, are less interested in the organized religion and more in personal salvation through some kind of a guru or um, or in something that may be not quite as overtly religious, like learning calligraphy from some kind of a master at a temple, but you sort of just tell yourself, I'm just learning calligraphy. You may be writing out the sutra or something like that, and the person teaching you it may be a Buddhist um, monk, but here it feels more secular and less organized. Um, so I think that that's, but I don't think it's, I think there's one generation especially who grew up, people basically writing China now, so people in their 50s and 60s who grew up in this real atheist, uh, under this atheistic education, um, who were born, say, in you know 50 or 45, 50, and they maybe don't know that much about it. I thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I'm Lele, I'm a PhD in history from Harvard University. Um, I have two questions. One is, um, I noticed that in your talk, you mentioned a lot of things um, like the Zhongguomeng or um, Jieqi, um, which are things actually, if you talk to people in China, they wouldn't call them religion or anything close to religious. So I wonder how do you deal with that kind of gap between sort of our um, conceptualization of, of religion um, between, between that and, and how sort of um, your subject of study and our understanding um, these kind of like concepts like religion, superstition, and things like that. If they don't call themselves practicing some kind of like religious activities, can we still talk about them? Like, or not, not can we, but like, how do we deal with them? How do you deal with this kind of gap in your writing? Um, yeah. Because this has been like something that I have been thinking about too, like when I'm doing my writing. Um, the second question is on sort of, um, you mentioned um, this foreign relations in this um, sort of um, issue of religion, but I wonder uh, where's the um, ethnic dimension of this? So, um, for example, if some kind of religion is um, sort of intrinsically de deemed as like intrinsically linked to a certain ethnic group, is there any kind of implication when it comes to like um, policy or people's understanding of the religion or practice of it? Yeah, Thank you. those are great questions. Um, this idea of what is religious or not, um, I, and I don't, I don't mean to imply that if you're interested in the mini in these seasons like Jiechi that you're religious, or if you're the, the China Dream is uh, is a religious concept, but it is interesting how people self-define, um, and this is a huge problem for survey work uh, on religion in China. So if you use that word, Zongjiao, religion. It's a very sensitive word, it's a very politicized word, and people, if you ask people, uh, do you believe in a religion? Um, and, in, 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 and this is often done by, it has been done by groups like Pew or 
other groups that have um, tried to figure out religiosity in China, you get very low response rates. You get sort of 15%. Because people, when they hear that, they think, oh, you must mean am I a formal member of a temple? How about, am I essentially like a lay person in the temple? Um, and if you wait, the more, much more effective is to ask people what they do and how so to concretely ask them. There's a, there's a good survey done um, a few years ago, and they asked people, for example, do you believe, has a, has a Buddha directly influenced your life over the past year? They used, they used the word for, but I think that could be more widely interpreted as some kind of a, a spirit or God. And something like 25% of people said yes. Uh, so then you get a much better sense of what people, because this term Zongjiao, it's very, it is sort of, it's a very political term, and people find it very, you know, sort of complicated. And so I think you have to, the best thing is to ask people, or is to observe people and see what they do, and ask people what they do. Yeah. Oh, and the second ethnic component. Um, so here is my confession, <laughs> which I, this, my book, focuses on Han Chinese. So I am not I do not write about the minority groups. Um, for a variety of reasons. One is that I think every book has to have some kind of limits. Mm -hmm. And I just thought it would get too complicated if I then were to include uh, Xinjiang and Tibet. I think these are also very different issues. Um, and I think they're worthy, very worthy of books and, and studying its own, but just would be set, I had to keep it keep it separate. So. But I mean, like, there's a big community of Tibetan Buddhists within Han Chinese too, right? Yeah, yeah, I do know. I mean, I think where it sort of bleeds over into that, uh, I, I talk about it. I think of this as kind of cultural appropriation. You know, it's sort of like people who imagine that they follow Native American, uh, you know, Indian belief, like I am running deer or something like that, and they have absolutely no idea. So first you sort of occupy a territory, and then you kind of wipe out its culture, and then you sort of appropriate sort of neat little bits and pieces of it because it's some sort of a new age thing. I think a lot of it is, it's, um, there's this guy, uh, John Osberg, who's done some anthropological studies, he did a thing called, a book called Anxious Wealth, and I think his new project is on um, Tibetan Buddhism as a status symbol among rich people, among rich people in Chinese cities. And I, I think a lot of it is kind of like that. When you ask people why, Han Chinese, why they believe in Tibetan Buddhism, first of all, they almost exhibit zero sympathy. If you were to bring up the Dalai Lama or Tibetan independence, they wouldn't be that interested in it normally. They're much more likely to um, think of Tibet as a pure, unspoiled part of China and therefore the religion is pure and unspoiled. And they'll sometimes say things like, oh, Han Chinese Buddhism is corrupt and, and, and bad, but Tibetan Buddhism is pure, stuff like that. It's, it's kind of naive ideas like that. Yes. Um, the urban, uh, all kinds of people in urban uh, congregations, uh, in Asian urban cities. Uh, but I find one thing interesting, um, the way the organized and especially the sense of belonging among the members yeah. of the congregation. I find that you know all of these, even they probably have different denominations like uh, Catholicism, house churches, or uh, uh, Tibetan Buddhism, but they have something in common that is the way they organize the group. They actually demand a very, very strong emotion from the members. I, when I talk to the, uh, to the interview with some household churches, I like, try to start some kind of conversation or discussion about the Bible. You know, they have a lot of Bible studies, but people rather avoid this kind of discussion. They will talk about the assemblies between the members. And so I agree with you. I mean, it, it is really, it, it's probably a substitute for the workplace. You know, in, I mean, in, in the most era, the workplace actually strongly affiliated everybody uh, in the society. And uh, I find it more interesting that people concern so much about the ritual actions instead of the sort of philosophical or theological study of the scripture. Um, 
even, so that is another tricky question, how to define uh, religion. Even in the barber shop, some Sichuan restaurant, before they open up the store, they have some kind of either the owner of the store, uh, the restaurant, or some trainers. They can uh, ask this, the staff to chant before or to dance before they open it. And that is some kind of, I, I don't know, requires a like, team building. Uh, yes, team, sense of team, sense of belonging. So I think that, that is so important. And of course, you know, all, uh, it is a common for all secret society. But, but, but for this, I mean, the sense of belonging, a sense of uh, identity, uh, it's really so critical to understand the Chinese religious congregation. Yeah, I think it's especially true of these big urban churches. And the church that I write about is one of, is one of these big urban churches. And so these are churches that will have um, scores or hundreds of members, and even though they're not registered with the government. Um, and they often, their members, they will have local members, but many of them have come to the city to study. And they often get recruited on college campuses. And so this is, uh, there'll be Bible study, and then they get recruited into the church that way. And they become kind of instant uh, community for people who are moving into these big anonymous cities. Um, so that's, yeah. It's, Why does a person become a Christian instead of practicing Buddhism or Taoism? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think there are a variety of reasons. I mean, some people, you know, it just seems more... It's the truth, you know. You, can't really, you, know. you may say so. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm just, I, but I think uh, that's what they would. Many would just say, "Well, of course, you know, because Jesus Christ is the Son of God." Of, what kind of question is that? Right? That that's the question of why? Why, why that? Because yeah. that's a foreign belief. Yeah. Well, I think some people are more. There is no interfaith dialogue, religious dialogue, no interfaith dialogue in China. And you sometimes hear the most outrageously prejudicial, <laughs> prejudiced statements that people make. Um, and people will often say, well, Buddhism and Taoism is just superstitious mumbo jumbo. It's just idol worship. Um, it's backwards. It's Mishin. It's superstition. But Christianity is modern. And, you know, I think there's this, still this idea that Western countries have Christianity, so it's not incompatible with modernity. I don't think people would put it quite like that, but then you kind of get that sense that, uh, but it creates these conflicts inside Christianity. You have some Christians who think, I can still carry out traditional cultural practices like tomb sweeping on Qingming. That's okay. Others will say, well, no, that's ancestor worship. We can't do that. Maybe we can go plant some flowers. We certainly aren't gonna burn anything the tomb. And then others who are much more willing to uh, uh, put Chinese tradition together with, with Christianity. Uh, so it's, yeah. Is there sometimes a sense that becoming a Christian is an expression of rejection of the Chinese government? Is it actually yeah. a political choice? It's, it is, I think, sometimes, um, for a small percentage of the population. Uh, but it's something, I, and my, my feeling is also that as the government has made it easier to be a Buddhist and a Taoist by having more and more temples, more support, um, if you're, let's say, in a state-owned enterprise, mm. um, and forget about being a Communist Party member, because if you're a Communist Party member, you can't be a member of any religious group. But if you're, but if you're a Communist Party member and you just go to this, you can say, well, it's not religion, it's culture. It's just, you know, our tr traditional Chinese culture. Um, and even lighting some incense might just be, yeah, to some respect, it's not really religion. So it's, it's kind of easier, I think, to be Buddhist and Taoist or folk or, you know, some traditional practice. Um, and if you're, <clears throat> let's say, I have a friend who uh, runs one of the, this martial arts group that I was mentioning. He's works for the bus company, he's a bus driver. And, you know, if he were saying, I want time off to do a pilgrimage to Shanxi province, uh, to, to the shrine to the Virgin Mary, I'm sure the bus company would say, are you out of your mind? <laughs> no, you can't do that. But he can get a week off for this. And then they're like, oh, you know, you're supporting intangible cultural heritage, and blah, 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 blah. So they give it some kind of support. So it's, 
I think they make it a little bit easier because I think this is very pragmatic of the government. There was time a time when people thought, will they have a new category of religion? Will they add folk uh, religion or uh, as a new religious as a sixth religion? Mm -hmm. And instead, I think they just said, forget it. We're just going to redefine a lot of this stuff as culture. The stuff that was called a lot of stuff that was superstition twenty years ago is now okay, but we'll just call it culture. And you can just go do that, and that's traditional Chinese culture. So the five religions all have hierarchies now, right? Traditionally, yeah. Taoism and Buddhism didn't. No. But now they do. They do. Yeah. The folk all... religion doesn't have a hierarchy. No. But in a way, you could think of the intangible cultural heritage. No, it's not the really hierarchy. But you, it's they can... difficult to create a hierarchy, right? Because it's such a mishmash of things. Yeah. But a lot of it is just, yeah. So it, it is not a, yeah. that order. Yeah, um, Mark. Yeah, uh, a couple of things. I think the uh, this discussion as to what what is religion has been going on in China for a long time. It's, uh, there's an anthropologist whose name unfortunately uh, escapes me, but he he wrote a very interesting article on the one, on the first and second British censuses uh, of religion in the new territories of Hong Kong. Total chaos. James Hayes. P P P what? James Hayes. No, an anthropologist. No, uh, yeah. but uh, a Fr uh, he's, he's French actually, but. Uh, the, um, the people that were being asked, what is your religion, had the foggiest idea as to what the census takers were talking about. Yeah. They, uh, are you Confucian? Of course I'm Confucian. Are you Buddhist? Yes, I'm Buddhist, and so on and so on, <laughs> up and down the line, because it was totally missing the point. And uh, so that it's not surprising that each census provided totally different results, right. uh, yeah. uh, which could not be predicted uh, for, uh, 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 except for that uh, lack of, uh, of, of a fit. But the business of, uh, of, of uh, Christianity and Buddhism, I find it rather interesting because in Taiwan, the <laughs> Buddhism has been triumphant. Uh, in, in Taiwan, it used to have a rather strong Christian presence, which really isn't there anymore. Uh, and, and the very organizations which were uh, rather, uh, which adopted many Christian missionary techniques, by the way, and which were pushing Buddhism strongly, such as Fo Guangshan. Uh, and, and later at Suji, they're the ones that are now having a presence in China, yeah. uh, which, which, which makes it all the more interesting, so that uh, it's, it's, it's Han Chinese Buddhism on the offensive, so to speak, in this particular uh, uh, context. Yeah, no, that's... Um, yeah, there he is, right. <laughs> I met him last year at uh, his, the temple that his uh, temple in, uh, in uh, Jiangsu province, with every building, and uh, so he's the abbot of the Taiwan Tsuchi. Uh, Fu Guangshan. Fu Guangshan. Yeah, Fu Guangshan. So he's, he's, he's met uh, Xi Jinping uh, four times or something. So what's the politics of the Chinese government? Uh, well, they like him because he's pro cross straits relations, uh -huh. and he came from inland China, and he says, of course, there's only one Chinese people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, so he's okay. Uh, but in terms of you know re redefining or how to define these different religions, there's another great example, even more recent, in Singapore, where, I, I don't know the exact numbers, but it was something like in the 1980s, 5% of people said they were Taoist. And then there became this sort of effort, I don't think it was a conscious effort by the government, but this consciousness that grew that the Nine Emperors, that's Taoist. And the Hungry Ghost Festival, that's Taoist. And now, when you ask people, you get something like 40% of people, say they're Taoists. But it isn't that the Taoists have gone and converted, you know, 35% of the population. It's right. just this oh, idea that, oh, well, that's Taoist. Okay, well, then I must be Taoist also. <laughs> um, and, you know, in Taiwan, what I, I thought what was really interesting that you brought up the Christians, um, I mean, there you have, this is, there's this uh, sociologist in Beijing, Li Fan, and he did this uh, mm -hmm. study of um, where house churches, where Christianity is the strongest, and where the atheist campaigns were the most prevalent in China. And he sort of, you can superimpose these two maps of China. And so you have a place like Wenzhou, which was a model atheist county in the Cultural Revolution, and this is sort of the center of Christianity in China. And so there's this idea that when you destroy the traditional structures, um, that a foreign religion like Christianity, especially one that doesn't have high infrastructure demands, where you can just sort of meet in a room like this and it can be a church, um, that it can grow a lot faster. And that also kind of explains South, <coughs> explains South Korea, because Korea had these uh, anti-religious campaigns in the former dynasty. 
Um, so, but Taiwan, which sort of allowed, and I remember when I was in Taiwan, there were missionaries knocking on the door every other night, especially yeah. the Mormons, and, and they tried to baptize my roommate, he didn't know what was going on. Said, they wanted me to go in the bathroom and get in the bathtub. I said, this <laughs> 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 And then I kicked them out. And, uh, but there, there's only 5%, I think, of the population of Christians. Like that. So. Yes, sir. Uh, an observation and a question. Um, Excuse me, some of the discussion is setting off the revolutionary side against religion, but it seems to me if we think about the cultural revolution, one of the useful ways of thinking about it is to see it as appealing to people's sense of what's missing and longing for certain kinds of spiritual things. Uh, so just one observation. Question It's in a different direction. I don't know if it fits your, your scheme, but it seems to me one of the um, overwhelming opportunities for a regime in the present period, but also a trap, uh, is uh, the product of environmental crisis. So we could we could say that we're in the era of environmental crisis, and one way that religion can play a major role is responding creatively to this. Now, the, the dilemma is a serious response to it. It's not enough to say we're going to do uh, renewable energy and cut back on coal uh, at the same time that you're going ahead with 7 to 10 percent growth per year. In other words, you have to, you have to uh, bite the bullet in ways that are very painful. And also, once you start talking about environmental crisis, well, isn't the regime to blame for some of this too? So it's, it's a very it's a difficult nettle to grasp. But I'm wondering whether this fits into any of your thinking in terms of the opportunities and the challenges of religion in the present. Yeah, I think one of the, the sense of crisis that people have is that um, it's not exactly the environmental crisis and climate change, but it's this idea that so much of life uh, is, is tainted, um, the air being polluted, uh, foodstuffs being contaminated, um, and it isn't all directly related to the environment, but this overall idea that we're living in this era um, Un, where things are not reliable anymore, you can't even trust, you can't drink the water, you can't drink the oil, the soil's contaminated. People constantly will say, uh, this is organic. You know, this is sort of like a saying, oh, this is, this is from the neighborhood, you know, they talk about this, and they, they, they're very interested in, in that. And there's some movements um, which are not exactly religious, quasi-spiritual, like Waldorf education, Rudolf Steiner, um, which actually, if you take it seriously, is almost a kind of religion. And they all, mm -hmm. I went to this to Chengdu to, to do an article on them, and they all, a lot of the parents, say 20 or 30 of them, have bought all these farmhouses in this village and practice what they call biodynamic agriculture, where they all you know, live together, and it's almost like a commune. Um, so I do think that that's, Part of this also, even if it's not formal, and then also the other thing about religion, uh, the environment, is Taoism is trying in this sort of half-hearted way to position itself as a green religion, and they they talk about it a little bit, but it ha I don't think it's really taken off, or there isn't much there. But they'll talk about Ziran, and it doesn't really mean nature in this sense, you know, in the Tao Te Ching, Ziran is not the same as Tao Ziran today, but they, sometimes people say, oh, you know, we're the green religion, we talk all about the Tao is ecology, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> thank you so much. I want to follow up on a couple of the earlier questions and push you to talk more about elite and gender, because, you know, you did that very important article about Xi Jinping's connections with Buddhist teachers in Zhejiang, and then we have the mass of rumors and reports and uh, information about you know, people in Xi Jinping's family who are religious and we get similar mm. stories about other elite families and they're often about women. Mm. And there's this general uh, kind of uh, rubric that people say that uh, the elite families or upper wealthier families become Buddhist and maybe Tibetan Buddhist as long as I've seen and uh, the less wealthy communities become Christian. So there's kind of a couple of questions here. Is there anything to that general kind of sociological parsing of change? And what is the real implication of elite change, particularly among, uh, if, it's, if it's true, among women in the leadership? Uh, what, what, how do you read that? You, you've already written about 
Xi Jinping's connections. So what about his family? Yeah, I mean, there's so many rumors about leaders' religious lives, or their, especially their family. Uh, it was widely, and many people will just are absolutely sure that yeah. Jiang Zemin's wife yeah. was a devout, devout Buddhist. Um, and then also the same with Xi's wife, that she's Buddhist. But then they'll also say that Xi's father, because he wrote the obituary for the Panchen Lama, that he was sort of sympathetic for Buddhism in some way. And, um, uh, yeah, I think it's a way to transpose I, the idea of religiosity on a leader without it actually being on the leader, but rather being on the wife. But I don't know of any you know, studies or any estimate on how many. It's still really sensitive. I mean, all Communist Party members are supposed to be atheists, especially people in the Politburo or the Standing Committee. So I think that stuff sort of comes out afterwards or on the side. I saw a picture, and I think I mentioned this in the book, um, of Jiang Zemin in a temple that was taken after he had left office, and he was offering incense. Now, it was not a, um, one of these sort of Xinhua-style pictures where he's just doing sort of a polite thing. It looked like he was really holding the incense in front of the burner. But it's not, and this was a, it was an amateur picture that somebody put up on the bulletin board at the temple. Uh, but you can't prove anything like that. And I don't know, they probably took down the photo after a while. What is your point about the, the gender part of it? What are you getting at with that? Well, a lot of people say, and it, it certainly anecdotally looks like that, that, that um, a lot of the move towards uh, at least Buddhism, the different kinds of Buddhism, among the elite is through the through the women in, in elite families. So I, I see a lot of examples of what that. What does that mean? I don't know. Uh, it, it, I, I want to hear what other people think about what that means. But uh, you know, we meet a lot of people who are very wealthy indeed, who sponsor various kinds of Buddhist teachers, Chinese, some Chinese, some Tibetan, um, and they're often women. Uh, and it's very, it, I don't know whether they carry their family with them or whether it's a, a gender difference or whether it's because of position of women in society. Since all the government officials are men, the women, <laughs> but yeah, you know, then the women are, are not the officials, they, they're private. They can do something which the man can't do. It could be just it that. It could be that. Well, there was, uh, mentioned to you, there's a famous, uh, how to describe him. I mean, he's a Zen Buddhist master, often called a Confucian, uh, sort of like a uh, Confucian, whatever, studies master. He just died a few years ago, Nan Huai Jin. And I went to visit him a couple of times, and very openly, Li Peng's daughter had been to visit him several times. I actually wrote about it in an essay, what a great guy he was, and how he taught her about compassion and, and stuff like that. Well, she is not sort of she herself was head of the national, one of the national power companies. I can't remember exactly. She was quite a powerful person in her own right. Uh, but this again would be something that people would say is culture, you know, not religion. He's just teaching her about traditional ideas. Questions. Let's say if you look at the Chinese cases, starting from the Han Dynasty, I think the Buddhist and the Taoist and also Confucius, is have a very and a hate and a love relationship. They fight each other. In the meantime, they learn each other. They just actually is mingled together in many ways. Particularly for Taoist, I think they learn a lot from Buddhists. And for different dynasties, Tang dynasties, from Han Dynasty, I think that's one or another religion will become the national religions. For instance, the Han will be the Confucius. Then coming to uh, uh, Sui Qin, uh, Sui uh, Tang, uh, then, the, then the Dao will become to mm -hmm. dominate. Mm -hmm. no, no, my question is whether, if according to your observations, I mean, it's, uh, uh, it's possible for China to have a national religions, either from the Dao or the, the Buddhas. The interesting topic is that they talk about elite families and religions. My observation is that uh, <coughs> Chinese phenomena of in various levels mostly inclined to the, to the Buddhists. 
uh, two ways. One is that, you know, is that the religions, um, probably back home, the families, mm -hmm. and the wife or the parents, etc., children. But when it public, <coughs> they only talk about it, divided, and they make a difference between the religion and the, the philosophy. So the government of Israel will be an open to talk about the Buddhist as a cosmology or religions and to debate and discuss about that. This is my personal observation. But my, my, my question is whether or not it's possible to have a national religion is dominant because this will be, they will be very important and have a big impact on the future of China. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I made earlier that comparison to Russia and Putin. And I think that the party uh, is not so weak that they need to so obviously instrumentalize religion and Xi Jinping will, you know, show up worshiping uh, in a Buddhist temple or a Taoist temple. That, I think, is extremely improbable. But um, I think Buddhism, you, you know, you made the point that, and I think it's, it's true, that elite families and upper class families tend to be more Buddhist. I think there is a difference because, well, this goes back, I think, to the Qing dynasty. In the, the Ming, uh, Taoism had a strong role the Qing uh, Taoism was, uh, you know, because it was run by, for a variety of, of reasons, but one explanation, run by a foreign group. Uh, the Taoism is the religion of the Han people, so Taoism was kind of suppressed, uh, wasn't as, as in favor at the court as, as Buddhism was. And it was hard if you were making a career in the Qing to get as far ahead, if you were, say, openly Taoist as opposed to Buddhist. Buddhism was kind of more so I think the effect coming into the 20th century is that Taoism devolved into much more 